Randy K, CNN, Atlanta. Well, joining us now by phone right now from the Los Angeles County Jail is Conrad Murray, also with us his attorney, uh, Valerie Wass. Dr. Murray, appreciate you being with us. There are a lot of questions I'd like to ask you, obviously, about this AG Live trial. I know you can't answer them or, or won't. Have you been subpoenaed to testify in the trial? And would you, in fact, be willing to give testimony in this trial if you were? At this time, I've, I have not been subpoenaed. And... Um I am not interested in giving testimony in the trial. Why is that? I would, not, I would invoke my Fifth Amendment right because at this time there is a, an appeal that is in progress. And um, depends on what happens to that, you know, it, it, in the event that there is a future trial, I do not want to have any issues of self-incrimination. Uh, I want to ask you about that appeal coming up, but, but first just a couple other questions. At the heart of this trial, of the AEG trial, it's a simple question. Were you an AEG employee, someone they had a responsibility for, or were you an employee of Michael Jackson? Can you answer that question? I don't want Dr. Murray to answer that. Okay. No, I cannot. Not at this time. Okay, I understand that. Do, can, I, can I ask you, do you, know, I mean, do you know the answer to that question? Absolutely. Okay. You've always maintained your innocence, Dr. Murray, and, and as I said, you're appealing the decision. I do want to get to that. But do you feel any guilt over the death of Michael Jackson? I'm an innocent man, Anderson. I maintain that innocence. I must tell you, I am extremely sorry that Michael has passed on. It's a, it's a tremendous loss for me. It's a, it's a burden I've been carrying for the longest while, and it's a burden I will carry for an indefinite period of time. Um, the loss is, is just overwhelming. He was very close to me. I was close to him. We were absolutely great friends. And to be honest, I became a sounding board for Michael. He offloaded and regurgitated everything that was bad in his past and everything that was dark. And I have been the absorbent uh, capacity for that. Was, he has, um, was that part of the problem? Those, um, was that part of the was that part of the problem that you, in my heart for him. was that part of the problem that that you felt you were a friend to him as a doctor? Is it proper to be friends with a patient? I don't want him to answer that either. Okay. I don't want to get into anything that could possibly incriminate him. Okay. Let me ask you about propofol. As you know, it, it's supposed to be administered in a hospital. It's a sedative used for surgery. And you certainly were not the first doctor to give Michael Jackson propofol, but you did order a lot of it. And, and as a doctor who swore to do no harm, I guess I just still don't understand how you could give this clearly troubled person this powerful sedative in a non-hospital setting. I think that's a very good question, Anderson. The thing about it is, I, nobody knows, but I basically was doing my endeavor to get Michael away from Propofol. Yes, indeed, I did order Propofol to his home, but I was not the one that brought Propofol into his home. I met him with his own stash. I did not agree with Michael, but Michael felt that, you know, it was not an issue because he had been exposed to it for years and he knew exactly how things work. And um, given the situation at the time, it was my approach to try to get him off of it, but Michael Jackson was not the kind of person you can just say, put it down, and he's going to do that. But, but as a, as a know, doctor, so my, though... My approach may not have been an orthodox approach, but my intentions were good. As a doctor, though, aren't you the one who's supposed to be in a position to say to a patient, I will no longer treat you if you do not follow my instructions because from the time you got hired in March of 2009 according to prosecutors you started ordering propofol in April and between then and June you ordered more than four gallons of the stuff. But you see Anderson, if the whole story was not told in court, I was offered to be Michael's doctor on the tour since in December of 2008. And you know, and you know, leading up to that, when the contract says I worked from May to June, but certainly I worked before that. But you did so order all that propofol. So there is propofol that I met in his home, and I use it. Certainly, you know, again, as I said, I was trying to take the item away from Michael so that he could he can have a more normal lifestyle. I did not agree with him whether it was on the concert tour or not. I did not. You know, it's, you know, what it referee me the day after the game is true in retrospect, but 
My intentions were to get the thing away from him, and I succeeded. I, I was able to wean him off of it. But Until three days before he passed away, there was absolutely no propofol given to that man. But, but you, you keep saying you were helping him sleep. Propofol, though, doesn't actually restore someone's body. They, they, they don't... I mean, sleep, you go into REM sleep, it's a dream state, you're actually restored when you wake up. Propofol basically shuts your brain off and acts as a depressant on your central nervous system. So, while you say you were helping him sleep, he actually wasn't waking up recharged, correct? Well, that's a, that's, that's a good question again. But if you look at my police interview, two and a half hours, I mentioned... And I explained to Michael that this is an artificial way of considering sleep. It was basically sedation, minimal sedation. So it wasn't actually helping him rest. Well, you know, again, as I said, I met Michael with his pitch in the situation. It, my approach of getting it away from him may not have met being satisfactory to you, but I succeeded up to three days prior to him passing. I was able to get him off of that. There were some other issues. Surreptitiously, Michael, in retrospect, as I learned, I never knew he was an addict. He was going to Dr. Klein's office and being loaded up with humongous, you know, uh, levels of, of, of Demerol. I know you're talking about... That was his addiction, and basically this does probably was what was causing his insomnia, and because that's a huge side effect. You're, you're talking about the, Dr. Orny... You're talking, about Dr. Arnie, you're talking about Dr. Arnie Klein, uh, who, yeah. who did not testify at the trial, and I know that's part of your appeal, which I want to talk to you about after the break. But, but you said that you didn't know that Michael Jackson was taking other drugs. I mean, there were prescription bottles all around his bed from other doctors, and I think any outside observer who didn't even have any medical access to, to Michael Jackson could have probably told you, I mean, anybody looking at Michael Jackson over the years could probably tell you he was doing something. Did you, you, you're saying but, you had but, no clue he was taking other drugs? But I, but I tell you, you know, I, I don't think the way the question is asked is, is accurate. If I went to your medicine cabinet now, Anderson, or in your home, I can find pills that maybe a doctor gave you six months ago or, or a year ago, and but, you may not be taking it. That does not mean you're seeing the physician. Right, but sir, you would, you would not find Ativan and Valium and, and things which are depressants and things which can actually slow your breathing which, in addition to taking propofol, can actually cause cardiac arrest. Well, well let's, say, let's look at this. Look at that. I, there were Ativan pills that were prescribed to Michael that, I, that my name was on those bottles, and they were highly directed how to take them. But there were other pills that they found in the, in the, in the room, and some of the items that they found and placed in, in evidence, I did not even see them. If you look at what happened in the, in the crime scene or the, in, uh, the house scene, Elisa Fleek, the coroner's investigator, admitted that she was moving items without the glove and putting them in different areas and taking pictures. So when you saw them on the nightstand, that's not exactly where she found them. The they were not actually in my view. The other thing that prosecutors have said, and, I, and your defense said that Michael Jackson self-administered a fatal dose of propofol. That was your defense. The jury did not believe that. Or prosecutors also said even if that was true, the fact that you left this patient alone with propofol in his condition was was negligent. Do you feel again any guilt about leaving him alone? Well, let's let's let's, let's talk about that. First of all, I did not leave propofol for him, for him to access. I did not leave propofol for him to reach and get it. I did not leave propofol in a drip. There was nothing like that. Even though Dr. Schaefer during the trial said that he could have gotten up and used a roller and opened it up and somebody said he could have reached up and find it. I left nothing such, no such item in his reach. Um, it is, he was not on a propofol infusion or a drip. Not at all. Absolutely zilch. But if you're saying you didn't leave propofol within his reach, how long were you gone for that he was somehow able to go somewhere in his room, according to your defense, find propofol get it injectable, and inject it into himself. Well, basically, when I left Michael, there was no further requirement for me to monitor Michael. There is no monitoring requirement for a patient who does not have heart failure or cardiomyopathy or some other condition where they have fluid retention, even renal failure. 
that requires monitoring when you're on a normal saline drip, which is just plain salt water. So you if, continue to maintain if, you did not give Michael Jackson propofol on the day he died? I did not give Michael Jackson a propofol drip. Around 1040 that day, after he really begged and, and, and cried, and he looked so... It was such a painful condition to see this man that was about to lose his entire potential, his fortune and empire. I agreed that I gave him a 25 milligram slow injection. That was it. You know, he, I was not even expected to give him sedation, but he got. He, he was sedated. He went to sleep, and I watched him. I sat there for at least 30 minutes. I was able to speak on the phone, accept calls. He was fine. Everything was great. When I left his bedside, I was absolutely comfortable that purple fog was no longer a factor. Done. We, we have to take I a break. go outside of the, of, the, of the master suite. The master suite is subdivided. It has a foyer, it has a bedroom, it has a, a sitting area in the, in the bedroom. The adjacent room is a dressing suite. Then it goes into the vanity and the toilet and bed, which is further down the road. You know, I wanted this man to sleep. And if, once I was comfortable and I moved away from his bedside to use the bathroom, etc., yes, I stayed in the adjacent um, chamber. And I used the phone, etc., etc., but I was not worried about him. Actually, I, had, I was already packed and ready to go home. But again, you're using that word sleep, and again, propofol doesn't make somebody sleep. So I know you were giving, you say you were trying to reduce the amount well, you were giving let's, him let's, over time, let's, but... Let's, let's change it, and let's call it minimal sedation. All right, we have to take a break, Dr. Murray. We're going to take a short break, and I want to talk to you. I want to talk to your attorney.